Thank you, Charu, and welcome back. So before we get into uh, the session on building India with Griha, so I'll just make a brief presentation on the layout of the next two days of program and uh, also setting it in context of Griha and how we are you know, uh, sort of aligning uh, with what try we are trying to communicate through these two days. So uh, this is the sixth edition of the summit that we are having. And this uh, slides gives the evolution from the first to the sixth conference. Essentially, uh, the progress in terms of the number of projects and the var variance of the different rating system that we have evolved over the years and also how you know our partnerships have grown over the years to take the sustainable habitat agenda forward in the country and particularly in the sixth conference we uh, are also uh, launching the existing building you know the customized uh, version for india of the lead rating system lead for existing building so that will happen tomorrow and as uh, many of you would be familiar that Teddy and USGBC, we have signed up a partnership as of July 2014 uh, to work specifically in the area of existing buildings and uh, customization of lead uh, EB for India as well as on the dynamic plug. And as of now, within the Griha framework, we have, as Amit would have said earlier, about 575 projects of different sizes, pan-India with about 21 million square meter registered. And capacity building being one of the key focus areas of the council, we have over 1,000 evaluators and trainers and a significant number of rated projects. And we are also finally now uh, converting the provisionally rated projects to final rating because this is something which we have heard over and over again that performance of green buildings are very very important to be demonstrated things can't be just stated on paper so Griha follows a system wherein a provisional rating is awarded when the building is commissioned with the green features and the final rating is awarded only after the performance is proven and uh, I'm just happy to state also um, in all the finally rated projects as of now, the performance um, has been significantly better than you know, what was also predicted. So that also uh, gives us a lot of confidence in what we are trying to do and uh, you know, achieve in the, in the current years. And also uh, we have had significant amount of adoption at the government level. And uh, particularly in this area, the state of Sikkim has taken it forward. And we are very happy that we have a delegation from Sikkim who are here to hear from our experience and also implement it in the state. Other than that, you know, along with the Delhi Development Authority, also we have worked out specific incentives, um, which is part of the master plan of Delhi. Uh, and um, there are other states and uh, municipalities and development authorities who are also taking it forward in their different capacities and with different kinds of incentives and programs in place. Um, these are some of the highlights uh, that this year we specifically thought of fel felicitating you know, the professionals who have worked with us continuously to take the agenda forward and we did it in the inaugural session. Tomorrow, uh, we would be uh, giving away the Griha you know, awards for the Griha rated projects as well as for the exemplary performance uh, of projects that are registered with Griha. Um, and in addition uh, to that, we also have, you know, the, throughout these two days, we have 13 technical sessions, 70 eminent speakers. And uh, like last year, we also have the NASA Griha Trophy, which was uh, initiated last year with support from Lotus Greens. And this year, uh, also Lotus Greens has supported us and we had the partnership from USGBC and Griha and USGBC have uh, given the NASA Griha Trophy in the NASA session in, that was held in uh, Chennai a couple of, in the month of January. And we'll have a session on that where the winning entries would make the presentation and we have a panel discussion. And on, the, on Saturday, there is a site visit to one of the Griha registered project. And we are extremely thankful to our sponsors and partners without whom the summit can never be a success. The first session is Building with Griha and uh, Charu has introduced the session. So now we will hear more from the speakers. 
Uh, the next, you know, one of the session that we have is on, um, which we call designed in India. And we are all aware that there is a fascination in moving towards, uh, you know, Western styles of architecture and um, sort of uh, not climate conducive Indian forms of architecture the are cu currently, you know, sort of uh, dwindling away. And uh, so this is, there is something that needs to be done about it. Uh, so this session will focus on local design solutions being propagated across the subcontinent by leading architects of India. The cultural sensitivity incorporated by international architects for projects in India shall also be showcased in this session. We have a session uh, specifically on water, which is, you know, that is one of the key component uh, in the resource uh, domain. And uh, I would also try, like to repeat a quote of a colleague of mine, which had won a Indian award, uh, an UN award. Uh, water, water everywhere, only if we share. Um, a very, very, uh, you know, sort of capable colleague of mine, uh, Megha, had written this slogan, and uh, which won her an award from UN. And this session would uh, particularly focus on the diverse approaches being adopted to ensure water optimization and availability of clean drinking water. And uh, we will also focus on, you know, water conservation strategies, technologies, and market-based approaches to promote water efficiency. We have a session uh, on innovating urban f futures, uh, where, you know, we'll be more talking about the cities in context of the 100 smart cities project that we have. And we will here uh, deliberate on the linkages between urban governance and our capacities to transform, innovate, and shape the future of our urban centers keeping in mind sustainability aspects. We have a specific session on urban infrastructure, and many of these would be, you know, these are combination of plenary sessions and also uh, breakaway sessions in different halls. And uh, we will let you know where these sessions are getting held. Uh, so in this session, we would talk about the energy water nexus that requires a holistic treatment. And we would focus on design and engineering feats in providing infrastructure and services to existing cities in India. We have a session on climate resilience, um, where, you know, specifically we'll talk about the climate change impacts in cities and how cities need to prepare or be resilient in order to cope up with these challenges, different types of planning mechanisms, what cities are doing, and also showcase, you know, very specific work in this area. Uh, we have uh, a very, very important keynote on bamboo for construction, and we are very happy that Mr. John Hardy, who is one of the leading architects promoting architecture through use of sustainable, you know, use of materials and particularly use of bamboo as a construction material. He has come in from Indonesia and he'll be sharing his design experiences with us. Uh, tomorrow we would be uh, launching the lead for existing buildings um, in the, and we are very excited about this uh, system and our partnership to take this um, lead for existing building forward. And as I mentioned, we have a session on NASA, um, uh, NASA trophy uh, with students. And uh, finally, we conclude on day three with a side visit to British School. So thank you very much. And we look forward to your participation, active participation uh, in the summit for two days. We, my colleagues and I will be available for any questions and uh, you know, take input from you for betterment uh, in, the, in the coming years. Thank you for coming. Good morning, everyone, Good morning. and welcome to the first session of Griha. So it's uh, really a privilege and an honor for me to be here, uh, given that I'm probably not amongst the senior most people over here uh, on this session to chair the session. But it's also a privilege to share the dais with all these eminent speakers to the left and to the right of me. And uh, as I was uh, preparing and going through uh, the notes for introducing everyone earlier in the day, I was thinking to myself, you know, okay, so Tanmay Tathagar needs no introduction. Then I was like, okay, wait a minute. Uh, Samir Devekar needs no introduction. <laughs> then I'm like, okay, Anurag Vajpayee needs no introduction. <laughs> so it's uh, ironic, but I'm going to introduce these people extremely briefly. We're going to follow uh, an alphabetical format, and we've also created a game for this session, given that we have a lot of people uh, in front of us who are going to share their experiences, very valuable and very uh, powerful experiences with us. So we're following a five-by-five five format, which means that everybody is going to speak for uh, five minutes, which has now gone up to six because Mr. Javdekar, uh, Aditya Javdekar is not joining us today due to some exigency. Yeah. But uh, we're going to have about six minutes per speaker um, or six slides. So
So this is the game that we created. You either do six slides or do six minutes, or do as many slides as you want in six minutes. So we're going to follow an alphabetical format. Uh, Atithi Devo Bhava. So I'd like to start with Mr. Andrea Pereira, who has uh, joined us all the way from Guatemala. And uh, let me read out a little about uh, Andreas. Andreas, uh, by qualification, is an architect. He studied a master's degree in the Technical University in Berlin, Germany, with a focus on urban management for developing countries. With the leadership of his business partner, Julio Alvaro, who's also with us today in the audience. I hope I got that name right. Alvaro, yeah. Uh, Alvaro. Uh, searching for new tools, came in contact with Griha certification. And also the first project certified in Guatemala and outside of India, which is an honor and a privilege for us. Andreas started the Guatemala Green Building Council and was the first president. Now it has grown from membership to 50 plus firms. While serving as the president and chair of the board of directors, the GGBC became an emerging council with World GBC and ultimately a full and proactive member. Uh, through the volunteer work, he is active vice chair of the World GBC Americas Network. It's an absolute privilege to have you with us, Andreas. And can we have you on the dais to make your presentation first? Good morning. Uh, I spent some time in India in 2007. Uh, yeah, actually, I think uh, I left India physically, but I had so, mo so many profound memories that I always found uh, a connection uh, throughout uh, everyday life in India, everyday professional services in India, architecture, uh, history, and heritage. So I'm going to try to sum that up into five minutes that we have today. Um, thank you for letting us uh, be here. Thank you for taking the time to, to come to the Griha Summit. And um, working with sustainability uh, through certifications and benchmarking, uh, I realized that actually uh, sustainable solutions for our countries, uh, I'm going to say very similar in many, many, many things. Um, we can go into detail afterwards, but, but, but I, I realized that actually um, our problems were process, thought process. It wasn't professional capability. It wasn't uh, financial. It wasn't economy. It was just thought process to, process to try to pursue a high performance solution integrated. And I think those words uh, are very important in, in any everyday uh, architectural services or consulting as, as the ones that we do in, in our firm. And also with a lot, a big sense of accountability. And I think that's our main uh, issue and our main obstacle. So I realized with uh, having high performance building or major obstacles were ourselves in a way. Um, so, and afterwards and thinking about uh, how do we do more high performance building, how do we, do we uh, engage the people or that are, is not engaged yet? I mean, I guess uh, everyone here is engaged, but there's a lot of more people uh, and, and developers and architects and engineers that, that I would like to come into our group and, and, and tell their story too. Uh, it's all about interaction too. It's how we interact within our context, uh, what makes us better to our context. And, I think it's very important how buildings uh, interact with nature. And I think we, we, we've been very good. I mean, historically, bioclimatic architecture was very good in having a, like a very, very not so defined uh, border between where we are and where they are, I'm going to say. And so if we try to blur that border, I think we can uh, be better. So this is not, this is our borders. This is Guatemala. Uh, it's, um, it's a small country, I think um, 108,000 square kilometers, I think it could put about 30 times uh, in India, uh, our country. And I don't know if this says anything, but um, there's, it's a weird looking shape. I think someone at the north when we lost Belize said, okay, let's go straight line to the, towards the south. Um, just to put it in context, we were south of Mexico. Um, it's a very beautiful country. We have the Pacific side and the Atlantic. And also as, as, as India, we have a big uh, heritage. And for us, uh, we are the heart uh, of the Mayan civilization. And they left us 
with a huge uh, impact on history and cosmovision and science and the way they, they, their thought process worked. And also it's very important to, to see what happened before and try to apply it today towards a new and green sustainable future for, for all types of cities. Uh, this is our city. Uh, like every city in India would say dense and constantly growing. Uh, we're growing sideways, up, down, everywhere. And so there's a demand of, 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 of having better results and processes in the design process especially. We also about nature and people. Our country is built on the natural uh, characteristics and our heritage in, in, in types of culture, everyday life and, and uh, faith. So very similar, I would say very colorful. We have the Atlantic side, the Pacific side. We have 33 volcanoes, which is a big uh, impact on landscape, which is, uh, I think, very nice. Also three are active. Uh, actually, that picture in the middle, uh, it was taken about three days ago. Uh, and then after looking into those, all those things and working a lot with LEED, we were kind of a, having a shortage on a residential, a high performance residential benchmark. So in a way, for a great project, I think you need a great client. And Daniel Paneas, which is his own house, decided that he wanted to certify a project. He said, just make it certi certified High performance, I wanna, I wanna be as more, as most ecologically sensible as possible, and I wanna live in it. So you have, it's a big responsibility for us. And uh, this client, this, okay, sorry. So, we, and we keep looking at the, at the, at the world map in through a vertically line as continents, all right, but we started looking at it a different way, in horizontal line, because we're actually from the, that's five minutes? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I need one more minute. And then, uh, so we have more uh, things in common uh, horizontally than vertically. And talking about efficiency, human and nature, we ended up uh, searching for a great um, rating system and actually it was very nice and we got a lot of support from the Griha and their institute to see if, uh, to take a pilot project and, uh, and actually apply it to Guatemala. Let us use the rating system. And in a way it was, uh, f it, we got four stars. It was very simple, very adaptive, which was, thank, uh, affordable also. And it made a lot of sense. And uh, so I'm just gonna go through, to finish the presentation through various pictures and, 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 and benefits or, or strategies that the house has. So, um, a lot of uh, native vegetation, rainwater harvesting. We have uh, passive architectural design strategies, uh, low VOC finishes, uh, local materials. Uh, they were left in a very pure phase, not to have so many coats within the buildings. Uh, daylighting, about 83% of the spaces were daylit with true uh, penetration through windows and, and ceilings. And um, uh, install a water, solar water heater a PV system, and it has a small swimming pool, so also it was heated by uh, solar. So this house can almost be unplugged from the network. Um, a good connection within the outside and the inside. It was located a little bit on a hillside, so it has the perfect view, a perfect place to see the sunsets. Uh, water use reduction, uh, and actually for our climate, we're very spoiled. Our highest temperature is 20, eight, or lowest is about 16. So we have that throughout the year. And so we don't need no HVAC system, no, uh, uh, no heating, no, no air conditioning, and that makes us really spoiled. So we're covering ourselves up with everything when it's 16, and we're less in shorts and sandals when it's 28, so. And this is uh, the final uh, slide. I, I just wanna say thank you. Uh, you're, Everyone's invited to go visit the house, to come to Guatemala. Uh, it's a lot of similarities, and I don't want to say this is the end of my presentation, but this is the beginning of a great relationship with uh, Grija and 
with this rating system. Thank you. So before losing the time, I'll just uh, uh, show a few of the projects that we have uh, executed. And these are the projects which are uh, certainly uh, 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 exceptional in nature, not because that they have uh, uh, something which is uh, out of the world, but I think the involvement from each and every stakeholder that made the project so exceptional, that catches your attention every time you, you visit the project. This is one of the projects that we have done in one of the villages in Dehradun. Uh, it's a University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, one of the premier institution there. And look at the size of the project, the way they have implemented the team's uh, dedication to bring something new and uh, very original. I certainly, in terms of the game of five and five, Gaurav, I'll, I'll pick the first one. I have more pictures, but we'll stick to the point. And you can see how uh, uh, the beautifully they have uh, procured each and every material locally. Around 90% of the products that they have installed there, or they have used there, they have uh, used very beautifully, but with the local uh, procurement systems. This was, again, the congratulations to the team that has implemented was there. And let's say the stone rubble machinery, they have a locally, they, you can see the picture, uh, they have plenty of stone available. Now they have used the stone masonry in their uh, foundations. Even the, the uh, use of floors, they have, uh, uh, for the floors, they have used the Kota stone. Uh, but the chipset that comes out from the stones, they have used in, uh, um, in the, uh, in the uh, finishing of the wall. So all these um, systems that they have installed, you can see it doesn't require any additional expenditure. The client has also explained and they have also calculated what is the additional cost that they have incurred. Rainwater, um, all these best features, zero waste discharge for the campus, all the beautiful technologies that we see and hear, the campus has showcased them. <coughs> Solar water heating system, and in case of performance uh, of the whole campus, this was the first uh, campus in India which got the Griha a four star rating. And in, after uh, a completion of one year, we also did the energy audit and the, the performance evaluation. 35 was the API number that we predicted and 34 was the final actual number that we got. Again, very small project, but the way uh, the project got executed. It's pretty much like a very customary and very uh, uh, with the routine work that we see. Uh, in most of the cases, we see that during the rainy season, because of the rains, water uh, gets clogged in the basement areas during the construction, certainly. And in most of the cases, we pump it out from the, in the utilizing the electricity. But this is one of the projects which certainly is uh, not in this region where we see the composite climatic conditions, pretty much the, the rainy uh, season where frequent rains are there. But because of the bamboo availability, they have devised uh, uh, this pretty unique system. What they have done, they have basically, uh, you, let's say, covered the whole basement during the rainy season. And then in both uh, cases, let's say in this way, they have collected the water in the gully trap, and this was also one of the areas. And then they have collected and reutilized the water for the construction purposes. Certainly, it is one of the things that is we have not seen. We have seen in uh, a few Southeast Asiatic region countries, and we, have, uh, we did discuss with the same sort of uh, you know, the system so that we can implement in, uh, in Guwahati region client accepted, and they uh, said that, OK, we will implement it. And it was done beautifully. This was, again, one of the things that we, uh, we understand and, and appreciate. Now, again, uh, in the, we have shown the project in Dehradun, in, in, uh, uh, in Guwahati, in uh, some region. Again, the, these, the pretty much like the normal uh, construction project that we see in Gurugaon. We, why we have shown this project? Because it's a rated project. This shows very, very high class, uh, high end, or five star, with five star facilities, uh, hospital project. But the way they have designed the project, the way the project got executed, certainly there were so many 
uh, uh, stakeholders, even the AECOM was the consultant for this thing, Terry was the consultant for the energy evaluation, we did uh, our bit in terms of uh, uh, documentation, GRIHA documentation and then the energy audit part of this thing. And then uh, the API that was estimated for the project was 154 and the final outcome after one year of, uh, of uh, execution, it was 109 API value. Certainly due course of uh, uh, the uh, occupancy, we realized that it, the project is not fully occupied as of now. Uh, so 30, 40 percent and then uh, certainly by the end of the year it was 65 percent of the project occupancy was there. But this is the phenomenal project because the conditioned area is not more than 30 to 40 percent there. So it looked like a pretty conditioned project, but the way it has been designed and executed is pretty much like the very uh, conventional, very uh, uh, passive architecture based uh, uh, project which has a plenty of daylight in inside of the space. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Kaurav, for the introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to be here to present this. In the best interest of the time, I would straight away go to the presentation topic, which is basically what I'm trying to do in this presentation is uh, showcase some of the strategies that are being adopted in our projects, which are sustainable projects. Sustainability, as we know, it's not a new subject to us, and it's not something new, especially for India, when we have got a lot of heritage buildings, monuments, and everything, which is so sustainable. And even after being constructed after hundreds of years, those are still efficient and comfortable. And one thing which I feel is really important and which is making these buildings so sustainable is, is the design philosophy which was adopted in these buildings, which is truly responsive to the climate, and also the materials which were used in these buildings which were actually local. So that actually is something which is making these buildings very efficient and even sustainable after construction of hundreds of years. We definitely cannot afford to have forts today. We, cannot, we do not have luxury to have forts or even the closed streets as it used to be in the old cities earlier. But what we can certainly do is looking back to move ahead. When I say this, what I mean is basically there are many principles which have been there in our traditional architecture, which have been used and proven, which we can use in the today's architecture, architecture and is being done in many projects today. So basically, the, the philosophy of sustainable buildings to me, it's basically a combination of passive and active measures, which make buildings really sustainable. One of the very important aspects in all of these designs when I talk about the sustainable buildings is the climatic analysis, as I said. So climatic analysis is the first step which you know we at ACOM is actually taking whenever we are starting a project. In few of the examples that I'm going to present is basically how we are utilizing these uh, principles in the designs. Climatic analysis, studying the sun, wind, rainfall data and everything just to make sure that we are making best use of the resources which are available at that particular project site and then move ahead with the project designs. This is a snapshot of one of our projects where you know uh, we have conducted the site CFD analysis. Now what happens is that whenever we are doing the site planning, it's really very important to look at these climate, climatic data. Wind CFD is one of the important aspects when we are actually optimizing the form of the building the orientation of the building, location of the building, how does the site context matter in terms of you know, locating your own building. And this particular building, when you see the center one, it's basically a courtyard which is also planned over there. Now courtyard, we know that it's very, uh, very good feature which had been incorporated in our old buildings and is being adopted in many of our today's buildings also. But what is important is that not just having a courtyard, but how do we optimize the design of the courtyard itself is something which is really important. And that exactly what we are trying to do, you know, by doing various simulation studies, by doing different analysis. In this case, uh, CFD analysis again helped us to optimize the courtyard design itself. Where do we have the openings? Where, at what height? What happens with the wind velocities? Because mutual shading is one aspect, but also the wind flows within the courtyard matter a lot when we are talk talking about the microclimate within that building premises. 
glare analysis is something which is also very important in many cases we know that daylight is one of the important aspects when we are trying to utilize the natural resources also on the energy efficiency reduction of the lighting energy but what is important that in our country when when we talk of sunlight there's a lot of glare also which comes in if we don't tackle with the glare part of it and we just keep on focusing on the amount of daylight it is going to defeat the purpose because if there's excessive light coming inside i'm going to switch on the blinds and switch off the switch on the artificial lights so the whole purpose is gone a lot of emphasis is being given to the glare analysis part in the designs which is very important uh, to actually uh, meet the intent then move on to the daylight analysis after your facade design is done you're done with your uh, you know uh, shading devices and everything on the facade you carry out the daylight analysis to identify how much is the lux level that i'm getting inside is another aspect that is being taken care of then moving into a artificial lighting design optimization now here i would just mention that you know it is a very important aspect which is generally ignored in the buildings lighting is one of the major components which is what is being uh, dealt very appropriately through the lighting simulations i would skip through some of these slides because of the time is very less these are some of the snapshots of one of the mixed use development where uh, site planning was done such that all the pedestrian comfort can be achieved because if it is a mixed use development people should also feel comfortable apart from the energy efficiency part so all the cfd studies solar studies were done to strategically locate even the landscape elements at site where should we have our water bodies where should we have our seating areas where should we have you know uh, this is one of the strategies uh, being adopted in this project water runnels beneath the ground surface to reduce the heat island effect to pre cool the air in winter season strategically locating the gas heaters so that in climate of delhi it's not just summer that we have to tackle even the winters are there so all these strategies are being uh, adopted and are being tested out is it really going to make any impact on the energy efficiency and what we have found out is that when we change the microclimate there is a lot of benefit that comes on the energy efficiency of the building also and with the another part which is the human comfort how does it impact on that is what is being analyzed and you know quantified here so a lot of difference in the temperature comes in at the surface level for the people who are actually occupying so in a nutshell what what we actually should look forward is the combination of passive and active strategies to meet the sustainability goals and to take it to net zero which is actually the next wave of green buildings we have already done net zero buildings and the the main principle which is coming out is actually even little things do matter a lot when we are talking about net zero buildings and which is what is being quantified in all these slides thank you very much good morning um i think that um, you know a lot of work we have done with um, green buildings and one of the main focus areas that we've always seen to achieve a performing green building we do a lot of sustainability in design you know a lot of you have already worked on a lot of green projects and we address sustainability reasonably well in design uh, we still don't address sustainability during the construction activities as much as we should be doing and we also definitely don't address sustainability in operations and maintenance and occupant usage um while um, ashish did run through you start with the climate analysis and then you slowly take your way through passive active strategies and then eventually through renewable sources and help achieve projects up to even a net zero energy status but what essentially happens is that all of this stops at design a lot of activities that happen at site a lot of activities that happen uh, beyond the occupancy of the building is very rarely looked at we look at measures of geothermal evaporative cooling systems night purge ventilation insulated envelope a lot of these are being implemented by projects and i think that all the speakers will share a lot of projects that they are looking at and a lot of people in the audience do this as well i want to touch upon a few other areas which is in terms of sustainability and construction 
uh, you know, the greenest way is to not build at all. The moment we actually build, we make a negative impact on the environment. And one of the things that we've started doing is started tracking every small activity that we do at site and its impact on the environment. Today we have an ISO standard and we have methodologies where we can track every emission, every activity and equate it to an equivalent carbon emission at site. And we have projects that are actually offsetting the entire construction through renewable energy investments or through uh, afforestation initiatives to say that actually if we did not build at all, we would not have any of these carbon emissions and because we're putting up this entire development, there is this impact on the environment which we are tracking and post-completion will offset. One such project is actually a one-hour retreats project with, which is coming up in Dehradun, which is for the last uh, three and a half years of its entire construction, tracked every small activity including the labor camp cooking that we've done for the labor using the LPG gas, all of gas consumption, all of electricity consumption, water consumption during the construction entire phase and everything actually has been offset to them be actually very soon to be declared as a zero carbon construction. The entire offset of close to about 2,800 tons of CO2 emissions in the last three years has been offset through renewable energy that they have implemented on and off site. Similarly, another project that is actually embarking, uh, that is looking at doing this is a project we're doing for the Titan Group in Bangalore, which wants to become the first corporate office to track and offset his entire construction. And not just during construction, post-occupancy also, they want to look at it. Sustainability in operations and maintenance is a huge area that we very rarely give importance to. I know there is a lot of existing uh, building movement that's happening and you know, thanks to USGBC and Terry to bring lead for existing buildings more focused in India. But one of the interesting things that we did <coughs> is a project that we did for Grand First Pumps in 2004-2005 which was uh, third LEED certified building in India and from 2005 till 2014 we've been tracking this building day in and day out. This is something that the owner is doing and wanted us to help them out and they actually upgraded themselves to a platinum rating through existing buildings when they went through their recertification. Very few buildings actually have this discipline of tracking the entire uh, activities post occupancy. You know when, when the certificate is awarded be it Griha or LEED or any other the certificate it's only the start of the green journey but pretty much you know it is dealt with as the end of the green journey and the building goes back to business as usual so one of the things that we want and we encourage buildings and operators to do is to keep track of it on an ongoing basis and one of the biggest challenges is to involve the occupants of the building in the building's sustainability initiatives itself because I think that uh, you know the very first time we put in sensors for one of our projects, we actually got a complaint from the senior management that says that, you know, when I'm in the toilet, after a few minutes, the light goes off, there's hardly any movement and it goes off and it's too irritating. He shouts at the uh, uh, facility guy and the guy removes the sensor. You know, the whole purpose of doing sustainability and design is lost when the end users of the buildings are not educated and trained to use the buildings the way they're supposed to do. We are working today with corporates like Cisco and Sare Group where every staff is becoming a part of the activity that happens within the building. Staff, in addition to what they do as their regular work, are taking up roles on ongoing sustainability activities within the building and within the corporation because unless we ensure that the occupants ensure and achieve sustainability throughout the life of the building, you know, it becomes very difficult to achieve a performing green building. Today, India is on a huge growth path with infrastructure likely to grow in the last 20 years. So it's very critical that we look, we are looking at sustainability in design, but we need to also look at it in um, construction and operations and at the end of the day an education and awareness for all the people who occupy these buildings. Only then the building will truly be a green building throughout the lifetime of the building itself. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. Um, so today uh, everyone is talking about all these green emissions, there is a depleting resources, there is a big problem. And uh, 
So we have an unsolved problem in front of us and that is what really excites today's young generation that we have something to solve. And maybe this time it's we Indians who can maybe solve it. So we at DBHMS, we work with this passion to maybe contribute to this whole effort of making uh, our Earth more safe planet to live with. So that is a philosophy with which uh, ours is a very young organization and we try to bring that passion to the table. So I'm gonna explain a few projects where we have tried uh, our bit to contribute to this effort. Uh, the first project I would like to talk about is uh, Irad Institute, this is in Gurgaon. So, uh, so this first, this project has two phases. Fun, first phase was already a platinum certified building and we got involved in a second phase. And here really benchmark was to do something more than platinum rated as well. So we were involved in uh, designing the air conditioning part of it and we started thinking what is next, platinum is already achieved, what do we do next in the next phase? So what we have really tried to do or, uh, in this project is, uh, instead of doing same air conditioning system which will function throughout the year, we have divided it into different parts. For example, we have uh, these flexible pipes which go in a slab. At the time of casting slab, they are already laid inside. Once we uh, pour concrete, all these uh, pipes are within the slab. And then we circulate chilled water through these pipes and that acts as an air co uh, cooling system. So now our structure itself is acting as an air conditioning system. To assist that, we also have regular ceiling fans because radiant can handle sensible uh, cooling load. We also need some additional uh, help in achieving uh, further thermal comfort. We also have civil ceiling fans. And we also have an air side system, but size of air side system is almost one fourth the size of ducts that handles our latent loads as well as humidity control. So instead of having a single air conditioning system, our cooling is now achieved by three various ways. And that is what gives us flexibility to control our energy consumption depending on the uh, climate or depending on the months where we need each of these. <coughs> so uh, these are the pipes which are laid inside. Also, when we deliver air, uh, if you look at the central section, we deliver air in the lowermost section of a slab and return air ducts are on top. So we are also taking help of natural way hot air goes up, uh, that principle as well. So overall result of that has been uh, really encouraging uh, overall operational cost as compared to the first phase, second phase building has operational cost. Their monthly bills all are 50% lower as compared to phase one. Uh, similarly, uh, they run chillers at night time. Once they cool the building, they don't need to start chillers for next two days. So we have really saved on uh, chiller operation as well. Uh, so the overall payback for that uh, project was 1.5 years. So after that, they are enjoying 50% lower energy consumption. This project is complete and running for last uh, two years now. Um, Another project I would like to talk about is a Nalanda University. Uh, so this was a competition and we are part of Vastuship Architects team for that. Competition brief was very well kind of a written. Uh, expectation was the project has to be net zero energy, net zero water and net zero west. So we cannot take any electricity from outside, we cannot take any water from outside and we cannot send any west outside the premise. And this is not a small project, this is 450 acres and overall built up area of around 50 lakh square feet. So it's a huge area to really achieve these kind of a net zero expectations. Uh, and it also made sense because this location is in Bihar where we already don't have all those uh, options available to tap in also. So for water, what really we are doing is we are collecting all rain water and using that collected water as our uh, water source for all activities. So this is the overall uh, site plan for the project, overall 450 acres. And all blue area that you see is rainwater collection tanks. And just to give a sense of scale, the central uh, square that you see blue is 14 acres. So overall on this entire site, we have almost 28 acres, which are just rainwater collection tanks. And that is our source of water. So we don't really need any water from outside. Uh, coming to energy, uh, again, we have a big site. so. Uh, for energy source, we almost have 58% of our energy will come for, from solar photovoltaic cells. And for rest, 42%, we are using uh, technology, which is Stirling engines, where we use uh, these engines to generate electricity and they can run on biogas. So we use actually, we collect various waste from uh, adjacent areas. There are a lot of 
poultry farms, dairy milks available in adjacent area. So we collect organic waste from these, uh, generate biogas and use that biogas to generate electricity. And the heat that we get out of it is again used for air conditioning system as well. So again, on a site plan, the central area where we have water body, uh, we have uh, all these PV panels on top of it. On air conditioning, uh, climate is hot and humid, very difficult to work on a, for, uh, utilize it for a passive design. So first point is where we have it on a psychometric chart, very hot and humid. So first we do uh, chemical dehumidification, so we reduce the humidity level. Uh, once we have reduced that, we do evaporative cooling on top of it. So by the end of it, we get uh, really low temperature as well as control humidity levels at the end of it. So we get air between 28 to 29 degrees Celsius throughout the year. So that has reduced our air conditioning load almost by 65%. Um, another project we are doing is at IIT Gandhinagar where we have, uh, it's done or, okay, I'll just speed up. So this is a mess block in IIT Gandhinagar. Again, uh, we did uh, various energy simulations and finally the option that we have, we have a central tower, uh, which is a supply tower, and then there are exhaust towers. So we supply air from a central tower, we do a misting on top of it, and the building is shaped to work as a machine. So we just have small pump, that is the only energy consuming uh, equipment that we have. Uh, so these are some uh, during construction photographs of that. I would come to last to our own office. So uh, we have also tried to do something in our own office. So we have a central supply duct we have an open office, so uh, green color is a central supply duct we have. On other end, it, we have two components. One is a air conditioning system, and second, the red one, it goes on our roof where we have desert cooler. So depending on season, like few, few weeks, we just run our ceiling fans. In some season when it is hot and dry, uh, we use evaporative cooling, and when it is hot and humid, we, use, we run air conditioning system. But the overall result is, this is a graph which is our electricity consumption. So we are on the top floor, which is a high energy heat gain portion. Uh, so we are second floor and we, I have also given a graph of first floor. So first floor is a green line where they have, their electricity bills are more or less constant throughout the year. While as in our office, we have a big dip for most of the months and only peak uh, in hot and uh, humid season. So these are a few uh, things we are trying to experiment and good to see that they are also performing on site accordingly. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As my bio data speaks, I have not, uh, I'm, I seem to be a R man, a track man uh, working on green buildings, but I was at the right time, at right place when the construction of new administrative building for Iris and Pune, that is Indian Railway Institute of Civil Engineering, was uh, commenced, I was there, and uh, I got the opportunity to be a part of that. And as, a, as I was throughout the execution of the project, I have been, I'm here to represent that project. Let me give me uh, some background of this uh, building project. Indian Railway Institutes of Civil Engineering is a premier institute imparting training to all the civil engineers who come to railways through UPSC and in service. And it was situated near the railway station, Pune railway station for the last 60 years. And our hostels are three kilometers away at Koregao Park. So a lot of time was wasted in commuting to and fro to the uh, institute and the hostels. So the idea crop up that, uh, popped up that we should have our institute near the hostels so that we can save on the committing the wastage of time and energy and the fossil fuel we burnt uh, will be minimized. Now, uh, the idea popped up uh, that it should be a green building as we are civil engineers constructing everything on Indian railways and all the civil engineers come for training to Irisen that this building should be a role model for the civil engineers who come here so that they can take this idea throughout the India on Indian Railways. Now, let's see the salient features. The building is uh, about 7,500 uh, square meter is the plot area, about 8,000 square meter is the built-up area. We have air conditioned area about 40% of the total area. 
And uh, we have got solar PV cells of 40 kilowatt, uh, that is 30 kilowatts in solar PV and 10 kilowatts of BIPV. And uh, the building is commissioned about a year and a half back. And in last one year, the energy performance we have seen and calculated, it is about 93.74% of the uh, basic Graha benchmark. It is only eight. And the water consumption is, uh, reduction is about 77.58%. It is astronomical uh, figures. I mean, actually, uh, how we achieved it, we are, I mean, uh, water, water reduction that we know, but energy performance, when we evaluated it, uh, then we uh, came to understand that the uh, we have on our building uh, various facilities um, on the stilt, then first floor, these are the second floors. Third floor, this is our heart of our institute. That is our all the classrooms and conference hall is here. It is all AC areas and we faculty sit on the top. That is the fourth floor. So actually third and fourth floor, these are the maximum AC areas and other areas uh, are non-AC and the common areas are non-AC. Now these are the things, the green building features we have adopted at Erison. So we have spaced, internal space is uh, such uh, arranged that the Heat gain is minimized in almost 75% of the areas. We have provided sk shaded skylight uh, to uh, in all the common areas for water consumption. We have provided low flow fixtures. And uh, as the building is a day use building, uh, housing about 200 um, occupants, uh, the discharge, the gray water was not much. So it was not compulsory for us to provide a sewage treatment plant. But still, we went on um, implement. Uh, uh, providing a sewage treatment plant of 20 KLD as the gray water energy, uh, emanating from this building was not sufficient for the functioning of the project, uh, of the sewage treatment plant. We took the water from the hostel. We treated it, and now we are using it for irrigation purpose of the landscape. That's how we have brought the landscape irrigation requirement to zero. Now, these are the... Now you can see some uh, wooden planks. Uh, this is the actually uh, um, prerogative for us. Actually, these are wooden sleepers. We have got so many wooden sleepers uh, released from the track. We have used them extensively in our auditorium, all the cladding works. And the one on the left, left hand side, the maple wood flooring, we had the building was developed at an old rest house where there was a badminton court. The badminton court flooring, which was released, we used in the auditorium flooring. And um, all the release wood from the rest house, the logs, they were used for the uh, fall ceiling and all the wooden um, uh, frames of all the doors. So almost 98% of the uh, 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 waste generated from the site was reinvested on this side and the adjacent side of, in, uh, of our uh, colony where a new colony building was coming up. So almost there was nil uh, waste generation during the construction. Now, uh, as I have said that the building was uh, constructed at an old rest house. I mean, all the facilities were available nearby. Now we walk actually from place of stay to office, thereby the fuel consumption, or the fossil fuel consumption has reduced to nil, from which was very substantial for two times to and from movement during the last 60 years. Energy consumption, as we have said, for uh, for uh, reduction of that, we have taken many measures, insulation of walls, terrace, use of uh, a low, high performance uh, um, ACs, and uh, LED lights. All these measures were taken. You can see the BIPV on the left-hand side and the solar PV on the terrace. And indoor environment quality, uh, uh, quality maintenance, we have got CO2 sensors in all the densely populated areas, low VRC, RAs used, and sealant spents were used during the uh, Construction, now the first motive was to train all the civil engineers for the, uh, uh, regarding the green building. The idea should be taken to all over the India. And believe me, in last one and a half year, all the civil engineers who, has come to, who have come to the building for training purpose, they have taken this idea to all the places, more and more engineers, they are planning for that. All the other CTIs, they are coming here and the purpose for which Erishan was planned as a green building has partially fulfilled. Now, as the ma'am, Gita ma'am, uh, Deepa ma'am has said, that constructing is only a beginning. Actually, we have to sustain it throughout the operations. It is a difficult part. Actually, we are finding it difficult to educate our people, but we are hopeful that we'll certainly do that. 
these are our agencies. Just mention a brief mention of our consultants, because as a track engineers, we were not very conversant with the green buildings, but our consultants, we had fantastic uh, consultants with us, uh, Shashi Prabhu and Associates, as our design engineers, and um, uh, Green Inertia Hyderabad as lead consultant and Griha facilitator. Okay, these are some additional features as a green, uh, as a civil engineering institute, we have put uh, Vishweshwara as bust as a, our, uh, what do you say, inspiration, and on the left-hand side you see, this is the symbol of railways, which is, FR, which is everywhere, there is no beginning, no end, railway is everywhere, and uh, that's all, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'll uh, try to make my uh, five minutes count. Um, based on our uh, experience and practice of uh, working in India, uh, one of the themes that Gaurav had asked us to uh, talk about was how is it relevant to India, how is it unique to India. So there are two or three things that stand out. Number one is, you know, based on all the presentations uh, that we've seen so far, uh, the difference between an individual and a collective effort uh, all the projects presented, including the ones I present, I'm presenting, are efforts uh, of uh, collective uh, effort and people coming together. There's so many people here that I see that are part of this that, you know, uh, so anything that I present, for example, I can't claim any uh, credit for that uh, uh, from people, uh, you know, like Pradeep Sasdeva and, 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 and Rajan and Saket. And, I mean, we've got people here who have been doing this and practicing it and putting it together. So that's very unique to India. The, the practice of working as individual discrete consultants, as it is practiced elsewhere in the world, and you know what is called the new way of design charrette is actually the typical way things work in India now, which is very unique. And all the examples of the projects that you see today are the ones where there was that kind of a synergy. So that's one learning. The second thing is, as our practice goes, transcends, uh, we've seen that the difference of working at different levels. So while we work at, at the policy level, there are certainly very unique things happening in India. I'm very positive about uh, some of the developments in, in, in our policy. So we, we have the fortune of working uh, with the USAID PSD program for net zero energy buildings under which Samir's uh, project, the Nalanda University or Anurag is working on a UHBVN net zero energy buildings or a net zero energy portal is coming up as a part is very exciting, the ECBC is being updated. The second level is actually the towns, the urban planning and the campus level where there are a lot of, the example that I'm going to show of IIT Jodhpur, for example, is one such. And then finally at the building level, you saw numerous examples. If we just uh, had to go through, I give you an example, I mean, on, on policy front that plenty. IIT Jodhpur, you know, I've seen that we have plenty of ideas there is nothing very unique about the new ideas that are coming up. The application is unique to India. So uh, IIT Jodhpur, the whole concept of how do we protect a large campus where there's nothing else from the hot summer winds, the simplest of the idea was to protect it with a berm. And uh, the scientific analysis and the processes that we bring help just com communicate and convince that idea. So this is the built form. There is a berm that goes all around and protects the, uh, the campus. And you know, we just simulated how does it matter if the berm was there or wasn't there with different, say, summer wind velocities, right? So you see this is a section. Uh, one is with the berm here, and one is without. Uh, so if there was no berm, you would uh, get the wind in the, the hot summer wind that will come in and actually affects almost all the buildings in there. The moment we add a berm there, it, it gets deflected and you can clearly see the difference. And you know, we tried this at various velocities and various, to say what happens during uh, one season and the other. Uh, this was a section that you saw a similar thing on the uh, plan. So you see this uh, without the berm and with the berm. So again, Without the berm, you see the same effect in a section, how the wind gets uh, into, the, into the facility. The moment we add, uh, there is a clear deflection. And this is at low velocity. The higher the velocity, it keeps going up, and you actually get much better protection from, from this. Maybe one more example of this. 
uh, yeah, without the berm. So you see it in plan, it's quite dramatic. It's almost like a comet going through. And you see that with the hot wind, this is a typical problem, Rajasthan. So how do you cluster? Even if you cluster, you get into uh, all the heat gains that you get into the campus. And with the addition, so there's no berm here. With the addition of that berm, you get uh, the winds getting deflected even in, in the plan form. The idea is that these kinds of analysis and simulation, again, are, you know, are, uh, as, uh, as Gaurav said, is garbage in and garbage out. It's so sensitive. And the, the, the materials, the data that is Indian is so unique that unless you practice that, it's very easy to uh, come up with all kinds of erroneous results. So one of the uh, examples, the next one I'm going to talk about, the last one, is uh, you know, a specific example of, of a campus in, uh, uh, in Bangalore. So we said, OK, we Bangalore, you're making a campus. Why do you need air conditioning? He said, no, no, all the simulation and data that we do shows that it's not possible. You know? uh, the temperature goes up and this and that. He said, yes, of course. So if you don't really know uh, how an actual building behaves and you've only worked on a simulation model, this is what will come. Uh, it was a long process, but you know, in the end, uh, through various kinds of analysis, you say, okay, we take the worst case condition. This is your, your cafeteria building with heat inside and this and that. What happens when there is, uh, uh, you know, and there's not enough wind? And, and how do you uh, actually show what are the parts that do get natural ventilation and don't get natural ventilation? We can actually do this realistically. The only difference is, to, in order to do this successfully, you really need to understand, one, the technology. Second, how the, the processes work in India, how buildings work in India. It's not a sealed building. It's a process where you can go in and out and do things. So to summarize, we do have the unique ability in India to work together and bring solutions that are mostly, I would say, common sense, but are integrated in modern buildings to create unique buildings and campuses and structures and urban forms that have not existed so far in the developed world. Thank you so much. So my name is Gaurav Shori. I'm a very proud member of the Greya family, one of the team uh, people who set up Adarsh. We now have a tiny uh, practice of our own called PSI Energy. And uh, uh, we also uh, uh, work as visiting faculty at the School of Planning and Architecture and other institutes where we try and share uh, our work. Uh, so I'm going to try and do this as quick as possible. It's called pushing the envelope because that's what, we, what we've tried to do in this project. We've tried to push the envelope. It's in a naturally ventilated building in hot, humid climate in India. It's a very specific case study of what's possible in passive design. So everyone knows we've covered what passive design is. It's about optimizing the orientation, Optimizing the envelope, but what does that really mean? Um, shading, zoning, and natural ventilation. So what I'm wearing today is the optimum envelope for India, northern India. And incidentally, you can see that I'm not topless like a uh, tribal, because I want to keep the solar radiation away from the body. So in this case, what we did with the building was we decided to just shade the building. We decided to make the building wear a kurta. So the building is fully shaded from all sides. It's also fully shaded on the roof. And we have, again, uh, got to highlight that it's all thanks to the team that was working on this project that brought its expertise on board. I'll share the team members' names with you. The next thing that we did was, so we literally we applied everything that there was possible in this case you know, to try and minimize the heat gains. The second thing that we did was uh, we had a mutually shading form. So we folded the building in and out to make sure that parts of the building shaded each other. The third thing that we did was we used a courtyard form, which is traditional to India. And it, uh, at, at any given point of time, two sides of a courtyard are always shaded anyways. So it's a topology that works in India. So we did that. We also folded the courtyard in and out. So there was mutual shading in the mutual shading. And uh, uh, finally, we took solar chimneys and put them onto the south facade. And we took intake vents and put them onto the north facade to pull in natural ventilation from the north, which was a highly wooded highly watered and highly landscaped area, likely to be much cooler than the ambient. Now, what we were left with is, how do we prove to the client that this building is going to work? So we have SP41 1987, uh, which says that you can go up to 34%, for 34 degrees centigrade and 40% RH uh, with wind movement. But the idea was, how do you convince the client that if you're comfortable, you're comfortable. 
right. So for that uh, what we did was we studied the tropical summer index studies. We studied the Fanger and Nichols model on how wind velocity impacts thermal comfort. We went on to study research papers from across uh, the world but highly specific to hot climates on how wind movement and adaptive comfort works in humans. And very heartening, uh, for us, what was heartening was that we have uh, Madhavi Indra Gandhi, we have Professor Rajan Rawal's uh, uh, Kabsi studies that we could add to this uh, literature and show to the client and say that in all probability, in all probability, it is still a probabilistic science. Uh, this building is going to be extremely comfortable with the combination of this draft that we are trying to create through passive means and your ceiling fans. So we had enhanced daytime air changes and night purge ventilation with high thermal mass. How did we do this? You've got a basic grid. We added some uh, RCC work to create shafts in the grid. The architect wanted to highlight the ikat weaving pattern from Orissa, so that was woven into the jali of the facade. Uh, we then had the windows for daylight optimization. Then we added vents over the windows for exhausting, and we added a hollow slab to bypass winds over the few selective air-conditioned areas in the building. And what was left with is a very fancy section that uh, of, uh, architects often try to cut, but unless someone doesn't do a CFD analysis, which I don't have the capacity to do, uh, one can't prove this. But fortunately for us, we had uh, Mr. G.C. Modgill of Sterling Engineers with us who said, look, I've done enough buildings in my life to let you know this is going to work. And that, I think, was uh, something that bolstered the claim. Uh, so what we were left with was, was a section in which we pull the air from one side. If you notice over here, we've got the outlet for the hot air, because hot air rises, politicians. Uh, they rise and then they kind of escape from above. But what we've tried to do here is we've eliminated the upper vents and only kept, kept vents below for the cool air to circulate. And only on the facade of the building do we have vents at a higher level. Uh, so what we started with was discomfort hours of 34% which means, uh, as per SP41-1987, which means that 34% of the time this building is going to be uncomfortable, crossing a threshold of about 32 degrees centigrade and 60% RH. Uh, this was with the envelope optimization. We then came to uh, the night purge scheme with higher thermal mass on the inside and came down to 25% ventilation. And finally, what we were left with, with the ceiling fan uh, worked into assessing the results, was 7% discomfort in the building. Now, when we say discomfort, what you're seeing is a flood graph. Each band represents one week. So the red is discomfort and the blue is comfort. You know what's gonna happen when you get uncomfortable? Something magical will happen. Your pores will open, you will start sweating. And it seems that people are scared of doing that today. So we had to tell the client that that's not going to happen over one whole day. It's going to happen over one hour in a day where you're going to sweat and you will use a mop to mop your forehead and that's about it. And the people will go home not dying of dehydration. But it took time to prove that to the client and it finally worked. Uh, in the end, the team of architects was Lotus Design. I can't thank them enough for uh, having the guts to do this. Landscape architect was Aditya Advani and I'll tell you why it was important to have a great landscape architect. Structural consultant was Maksud Nazar. MEP was, of course, Mr. Modgil and GC Modgil. And last but not the least was PSI Energy. Uh, this is what the project resulted in, ladies and gentlemen. We got an official letter from the government of Virissa saying, we are letting you play as long as you're willing to undertake that the indoor temperature of this building will not cross 35 degrees centigrade. 35. That's ridiculous. In any energy con uh, engineer's minds, it would be ridiculous. But of course, we told them it's not about 35. We are asking for 32. Can you let us work with the SP41 limit? And they gave us this go ahead. So it's possible as long as the whole team is committed to creating this. So one of the things that I did notice in all the buildings in the past, all the case studies that were shown, that the landscape didn't look like it belonged in India. It was very crucial that the landscape be rich, dense with trees, highly shading, very cool providing, and that is where the air pulls in from and maintains an overall urban highland, island, uh, heat island effect reduction as well. Thank you very much.